Now you can bring him in, Jack. All right, charge this one now, Rich. Charge it, Richie. Charge this one now. Oh, what? Bad, bad bounce. Hop. Bad it's bounce. Bad hop, all right. Here we go. Get this come one on in come, now, on, Rich. come on, come on. Stay right on it now. That's oh, the way. Give him a nice hand. Bring him in here. So you see the subtle advertising of Lucky Strike, even on a kid's show, Happy Felton's Not Whole Gang. And then the story begins from there. He urged me to save a lot of the advertising that now comprises the uh, Center for the Study of Tobacco and Society. And also I see Lori Jacoby, who even after seven years of working at the center as our full-time archivist, uh, uh, it's amazing you're still talking to me, but uh, we, did a previous, we did a previous exhibition, and I, now I realize how difficult it is to do exhibitions. Just this thing took months and months. Uh, but Lori and, and uh, Randy McCready and, and I did the Museum uh, of Natural History uh, exhibition on cartoonists take up smoking and that took quite a few years and um, so um, you know it's this is where the collection began is way back then since then by the way the current collections manager is Thomasina Taylor who has been a gem she's a graduate student recruited by Steve McCall who you'll meet in just a second and although you'll see students having to leave by the way you can leave through the back it might be a little less, you know, easier. Um, but it's really through the uh, auspices of these students that a lot of this has been able to be accomplished. So I started collecting, and among the things that have entered our collection in recent years is a whole bunch of wire service photos. This is a picture of Dr. Leroy Burney, who was the Surgeon General in the 1950s, in the Eisenhower administration, who actually was the first Surgeon General to issue a public statement saying, we really are accumulating enough evidence to say that smoking is a major cause of death and disease. Now, the government did not go along with that, uh, nor did the American Medical Association, which wrote a ferocious editorial saying, not so fast. Um, but then, uh, when Kennedy was uh, uh, elected president, he appointed a Surgeon General, Dr. Luther Terry. And this is Dr. Terry right as his appointment was announced. Uh, with his son Michael, who couldn't be here today, and Janet Terry, who was also a wonderful person who became the honorary chairman of the group that I had called DOC, or Doctors Ought to Care, when Dr. Terry passed away. Uh, this is a classroom in England after the Royal College of Physicians issued its report two years before our Surgeon General's report, and they organized a number of anti-smoking leagues. So this is a, a meeting in a high school, a public school, uh, which is actually a private, they call public schools private schools and private schools public schools in England, uh, at a school where they were holding a meeting of the Anti-Tobacco League and a member of parliament was speaking. And this was organized by a 15-year-old uh, student at that school. And here is Dr. Terry announcing the appointment of the advisory committee that Don Shoplin is going to talk about, uh, that he was a, a staff member for. This was uh, going back now to 1962. And the story behind this report is amazing because there were two influences, the American Cancer Society, and we do have someone from the American Cancer Society. Gina, thank you very much for coming. Um, and uh, uh, they went to President Kennedy and said, we need to have a report on this issue. We need to do something. The government needs to take action. And look at the Royal College of Physicians look what they have done. We need to do something. Well, Kennedy hesitated a bit, but then one reporter by the name of Edgar Prina of the Washington Star stood up at a press conference that Kennedy was holding on some other event and sort of blindsided him with a question of what is the administration going to do about smoking? And Kennedy literally stepped back and was, was befuddled and said, well, I'll get back to you. And he joked about the stock market being affected, but he sort of had to get back to them. And that crystallized the formation of the Surgeon General's Committee. I met uh, Edgar Pinner last year. I interviewed him, and he passed away just this spring uh, at the age of 92. Um, this was the advisory committee, again, that Don Shoplin will talk more about. One of these members is Dr. Mickey Lemater, who is a distinguished alumnus of our university. We are the only state with two members of that, uh, of that committee, and uh, it's quite a story. Dr. Terry releasing the report, you'll see more of this uh, in the uh, foyer. And this is Dr. Terry's daughter, Jan. Uh, she was shown, uh, this went over the wire services, you know, crushing the cigarette packs and so forth. And Dr. Terry, a year later, he didn't just sit on his laurels. He went around and started really backing this report. He didn't have to do this. Um, and then with Senator Marine Newberger. Senator Newberger was really the unsung heroine of this entire issue. Her husband died of lung cancer. And she, when she was elected in his seat out of Oregon, she took upon herself to fight the tobacco industry directly, and she challenged them, and she was quite a nemesis. She even also took on the AMA, and you'll see a little quote of hers in the film that we'll show. 
Dr. Cherry was so reviled by the tobacco industry that I found this item uh, in Europe. Uh, his, his reputation preceded him. There was even the anti-Terry report. So uh, it, it shows you the impact of one person. I got to know Dr. Terry in, in the 1980s, and he was as wonderful in person as he was as a spokesperson. This is Dr. Terry's posthumous uh, induction into the Alabama Healthcare Hall of Fame in Montgomery in 2002. And that's Michael Terry speaking there. And that's Luther Terry Jr., uh, or is it the third, uh, speaking. And um, that's the family afterwards, and uh, I had to get into the picture. Um, but uh, here we are today commemorating the anniversary. I'd like to have, if possible, uh, Dr. Stephen McCall say a few words, uh, maybe to, tell, to set the stage a little bit about the center and about the exhibition and about what we're going to hear a bit more today, because it couldn't have happened just by me. It had to do with a lot of people, largely due to our guiding light, Dr. McCall, who's recently been the interim director of the School of Library and Information Studies, and also my personal friend. Thank you, Alan. Good evening, everyone. Again, my name is Stephen McCall. Um, I am an associate professor in the School of Library and Information Studies, which is a part of the College of Communication and Information Sciences here on campus. The University of Alabama, and indeed the state of Alabama, benefits from having an ALA accredited School of Library and Information Studies. Um, that means that we have students here who are learning. Um, we have students who come back for, for additional education, and the the sign of a good professional education is to provide experiences for these students while they're on campus. And the Center for the Study of Tobacco and Society has indeed served that role quite well. Um, there are basically two eras of participation. Uh, I like to uh, refer to the before Dr. Ryder and after Dr. Ryder. So Dr. Bob Ryder is my colleague who came on campus in 2010, and I've been here since 1997. And the period before Dr. Ryder's uh, arrival, we provided students to assist in the day-to-day -day activities of organizing the center. And that was under the auspices of Lori Jacoby and Jennifer Land, who were the full-time staff during that period. Um, and after Dr. Ryder's arrival, we hired him because we wanted to expand our archival education. And uh, after his arrival, we were able to uh, look at the center from uh, archivist eyes. And, uh, and that led to all kinds of uh, additional opportunities for learning for our students. Also unveiled our digitization era, and we have a, a fine online presence, again, thanks to the students and to uh, uh, Dr. Ryder's efforts. So uh, the school is supported by both faculty members, and we also, I wanna mention, have an MFA program in the book arts, and the center has been an opportunity for several students to uh, create books based on materials uh, that were selected by uh, Dr. Blum and um, and were turned into uh, book art books uh, by book artists, and I may run up and get a couple of examples of those for for later on. So, uh, so the center being right across campus, right right across the quad, has also been ideally located to serve us and educating our students of the School of Library and Information Studies. So I just wanted to mention a few students and where they are today. We've had over 30 since the early 2000s. And um, the first two students who worked uh, with the center were a part of the original advisory committee, uh, Stephen Turner, who's now a librarian here at the University of Alabama. Uh, also, Dr. Toby Graham provided uh, early uh, strategic uh, advice to the center, and uh, he is now deputy university librarian at the University of Georgia and head of special collections. So, again, so we basically helped to launch that career. Is how I uh, like to look at it, both slits and in part some of the experience that the center provided for him. Um, before 2007, there were several students. Uh, Tinley Baker, who's now the librarian and technical director at the Highland School in Birmingham. Catherine Wilkins, who's the assistant librarian at the Virginia Historical Society now. Um, in the 2008 to 10 period, we had Philip Anglin, who was at the Mobile Public Library after graduation, now a student at the Lancaster Theological Seminary in Pennsylvania. Um, David Nolan was a uh, student worker there. Now he's uh, just tenured at, at Mississippi State University Libraries. 
and uh, Jessica Peterson, uh, who is one of our book artists who uh, designed and created books based on Dr. Blum's selection of materials, is a solicitor instructor and proprietor of the Southern Letter Press, which is a shop in downtown Northport. Now, in the post uh, Dr. Ryder era, we've uh, We've expanded opportunities for students, and probably half of our students have begun working in the past uh, several years, since 2010, because we expanded our opportunities for the student learning, including the creation of finding aids, the digitization efforts, the online presence, and we're looking for great things from these students as they go out into the work, work world. I would like to, again, thank Lori Jacoby for her contribution to leading uh, the student efforts and, and helping the students to stay focused on their tasks. And Jennifer Land may not be here at the moment. She joined after Lori's departure. And then, as Dr. Blum mentioned, after Jennifer's departure was Thomasina Taylor. OK, and uh, in closing, I just want to mention two things. One, we're looking forward to the next generation of interaction with the center, which would mean uh, hopefully the hiring of a project archivist who can uh, oversee uh, official internships for our students, which will uh, help them and, and get uh, credit for their work and uh, rather than having in a pay environment. And this is really, really good for students who uh, need to get experience under the, uh, under the consent of a professional archivist. And having the professional archivist on site will be very helpful as well in planning, exhibition planning, and the growth of the center. And finally, I want to thank Dr. Blum for giving me the opportunity also to work with him because it's been near and dear to my heart for one special reason, and that is that I was a flight attendant during the period of, of the ending of smoking in the airlines, so I got to see the before and the after. And the before was quite horrific, um, both to be on the plane, uh, the, the planes in the 80s were designed to handle smoke if it were scattered out throughout the cabin. So if you were to gather it up behind row 20, well, that w would overload the system in that area. And of course, overloaded systems would, on longer flights could lead to some discomfort throughout the cabin. And also, it, it taxed, and this is the, the it is a, it is a, um, well, a gross thing to say, but uh, if it's at the end, then it's the back uh, filters of the airplane that take take the uh, uh, um, the brunt of that. And I've seen the cleaning of those external uh, filters. So just to see what can happen in extended flights with tobacco circulating in the rear of the airplane. Uh, so then again, I was able to see the clearing uh, in the skies. It was a, a radically different experience. So, so seeing this, uh, this issue documented in such a way and having the students of the School of Library and Information Studies benefit so conveniently <laughs> right across the quad and uh, very materially and to have demonstra demonstrated outcomes for good job placements uh, really, I think, is a, a feather in our cap to work with the center. So thank you. Mutual admiration. Uh, one other connection to the airline smoking ban is another alumnus of the University of Alabama, Claude Pepper, who became a senator and then a congressman. And we, we knew him, Doris and I, in, in Miami when he was our congressman. And uh, he was 88 years old when uh, the uh, now senator from uh, Illinois, Dick Durbin, then a representative, uh, was flying back from Arizona to Illinois on and didn't get a non-smoking seat. And so he... Uh, uh, he wrote a, a little bill and uh, on a napkin, and when he got back, and you'll see this in the film, he went up to Claude Pepper and said, what do you think? Can you do this? And he said, I've got a way. After every other committee chairman had uh, turned him down, and they, they slipped this bill through, and that's how we can get on an airline today and, and breathe clean into our air. But it's, it was a long battle of about 30 years that uh, Patty Young, a flight attendant uh, for American Airlines, uh, uh, tried very hard to do. Um, I know that I got to advance that to that, right, Aaron? And then that's Stephen, in case you didn't know him. And um, I wanted to introduce uh, uh, Celia Wallace, uh, who is uh, an amazing individual. When you go to Spring Hill Hospital, you walk in and you see a beautiful portrait of uh, Dr. Wallace. And it says, um, it is my right to be uncommon if I can, to seek God's will first and then pursue the opportunity at hand with persistence and perseverance. Nothing's impossible. Just get on with the task at hand. Limited only by my own vision to take the calculated risk to dream and to build, 
to fail and to succeed, to prefer the thrill of challenge to the stale calm of utopia, to think and act for myself, then share the benefits of my creation. As a doctor, to recognize the vital importance of the physician's input in designing and creating an ideal hospital environment, to face the world boldly and say, this I have done. Uh, then to remember the words of Sir William Osler, what has been accomplished is only an earnest of what shall be done in the future. Upon our heels a fresh perfection must tread, born of us, fated to excel us. Um, Mrs. Wallace has been on the boards of probably every major organization and university in the state. Uh, she is the chairman of the board of Spring Hill Hospital, which was founded by uh, Dr. Wallace. She has been uh, related to this university where she uh, 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 received her degree. And also I noticed on the, the biography that Ruby Harmon sent that you received the Joseph Cullen Award for uh, Smoking and Health. And Dr. Don Chaplin and I know Joseph Cullen, knew him very well. He had been a priest and he um, became a health advocate and he was grabbed by the government to run the very first major uh, anti-smoking program called Commit. So it was a double honor to hear that you had received this honor and I wondered if you would come up and, and share with us some of your views about the impact of smoking that you have have observed or anything else you'd like to say? Thank you so much. You know, um, when I first met Dr. Blum, it was such a wonderful thing because two things. I had been dragging to our pathology department every young person that I knew that smoked. I was very serious about it. And as I'm admonishing them, as we go to pathology, and I show them the ugliest lung that our pathologist has, it was nice for me to see Dr. Blum and say, ah, this man has a different way of trying to convert. And uh, I'm looking at the back at one son who's grinning because I caught one of his friends and he was smoking. So it, it is one, I like Dr. Blum's way of trying to have a smoke cessation. One of the ways that we became involved here was after trying on a very serious, uh, really a very serious plane, to affect those who were smoking, it was very evident that we weren't making very much progress. And the loss of my husband and the loss of my children's father was the greatest thing and the greatest injury to any of us. He died when one son was 14 and one daughter was five. Nobody understood that because we had all begged him, just begged him to stop. We just didn't want the smoke and we didn't want to lose him. As a physician at that time, he had been very successful in getting both my father and many of my father's friends to stop smoking but they smoked cigarettes. He smoked cigars. He smoked hand roll tobacco cigars. And it wasn't the tobacco at that time. We've come a long way in analyzing and knowing that they all contribute, but yes, tobacco does have um, a detrimental effect on the lungs. So, from that standpoint, it looked like the easiest way for us was to join arms with Dr. Alan Blum, try to create uh, this wonderful endowed chair with total primary concern being, let's stop the world from smoking and from contaminating all of those around us. So hurt, injury, all came about from smoking. So if I have one word to say, and I feel like I'm talking to the choir, but it is one for everybody that you can get to stop smoking, it is well worth it. The impact is great. But the tobacco industry is a very strong industry. It's a very lucrative industry, and it's a very powerful one. So what I wanted to say, if we all join hands and follow Dr. Blum as our leader, I love his humorous way 
uh, portraying the tobacco, because you know the cartoonist, he's right. The cartoonist always used tobacco in such a, a truly humorous way. I can look at myself and say, LSMFT, I learned that. I was about four, but my dad smoked Lucky Strikes. And then do you remember the TV programs where the pager walks out and he says, call for Philip Morris. Y'all, those are my childhood memories. Those are things that it takes a lot to turn around a whole universe that's used to being okay with smoking. And it's just been within the past years that we have begun. And Dr. Luther Terry started that by he hung tight and was, uh, he persevered where many of us uh, probably slacked off. But my thing is, if we can do the stamp for him, I'd love to see all the letters going out throughout this country that has a smoking cessation of where we just stop. But we keep our loved ones, we keep our friends, and we're able for each young person who starts, that's an invincible age. So we all need to work together and have a crusade. And Dr. Blum is a good leader for that. I am delighted to be here, delighted to, to be with those who recognize Dr. Luther Terry. And uh, he was such a formidable person, I will say uh, as my closing statement, his statement came out as I was a freshman in college and I had a smoker for a roommate. So what a way to begin, huh? I relate them back and I historically I say, oh wow. So with that, I look forward to the exhibit. I'm happy to be a part of it. My children and I love doing everything that we can do to enhance the no smoking. So thank you, Dr. Blum, from us. That was great. You know, speaking about fun, actually, uh, you know, you used to go on an airline. Steve, you remember when you used to offer uh, passengers a, a magazine? So I took this one. Um, and it was, uh, you know, there's uh, the famous Naomi Campbell model. And of course, uh, the back cover was usual Marlboro. So what we used to do, it gives me an idea to resurrect this. We take out these stickers that we printed up. It said, many of the ads in this publication are misleading, deceptive, and a ripoff. For example, smoking doesn't make you glamorous, macho, successful, or athletic. It does make you sick, poor, and dead. And we take that, and we would you know, slap that right back on the magazine. And, and sometimes the flight attendants would catch us, and they said, what are you doing? And I said, oh, we're just, you know, and they'd look at it, and they'd say, oh, that's good, and can we have some more? So I've got, I've got some stickers for everybody here. Never can tell where you might find these. So, Dr. McKnight, here you go. Here's some for you. Pass these out. There we go. So here, have some. Pass them out there. Um, the, um, there we go. I wanted to play something now that is, again, history. Dr. LeMater, who graduated, who is a native of Tuscaloosa and who graduated from the University of Alabama, has been named a distinguished alumnus. Speaking of distinguished alumni and alumna, Margaret, thank you so much. Margaret Garner, who's been our senator from the College of Community Health Science, Sciences uh, for so long, and Cynthia Tyler and Linda, and thank you for coming. And also to Lynn Wilcox, who has been the most incredible uh, devoted person who's headed up our, our tobacco task force for all these years where we're finally making progress. Um, thanks for coming. And I meant to also thank Steve Miller, who's head of the Faculty Senate, for joining us. And our students, uh, uh, Haley and Kate and Lizzie and others, thank you so much for having, I know you've been working on projects upstairs, but thanks for coming. So this is Dr. LeMater when he spoke. He came here a few years ago, but this is actually a, a report that he gave in um, uh, 2007 at MD Anderson uh, Cancer Center, and he spoke where he was still, he was director emeritus of the MD Anderson Cancer Center, and he talked about the uh, day that the report was released. The report was scheduled for release on January the 11th, 1964 at the State Department on a Saturday when the stock market would be closed. The report was delivered in an armored truck at 7 a.m. to the State Department Auditorium. A single copy for President Johnson was delivered to the White House at the same hour. 
Each committee member was assigned a numbered seat on the stage, as was Surgeon General Terry and his staff. At 8.30 in the morning, in a separate locked room, the press and the media received a numbered copy of the report and were given 90 minutes for review. They had been instructed they would not have telephone access or be allowed to leave until the press conference concluded. That may be one of the more amazing things that happened. <laughs> Surgeon General Terry commented on the preparation of the report. I want to express our gratitude to the distinguished members of the committee for unstinted devotion with which they applied their scientific skills to the preparation of this report. This has provided us with the most comprehensive compilation and analysis ever undertaken on the relationship of smoking and health. At the time I requested this group of 10 eminent scientists to undertake this evaluation, neither they nor I fully appreciated the immensity of the task on which they would be embarked, nor did any of us realize the demands on time and effort that would be exacted by the evaluation. To them, to the many consultants who assisted, to the committee staff, we are measurably dedicated. Dr. Terry, after introductions of the committee and staff, summarized the major uh, conclusions. Quote, out of its long and exhaustive deliberations, the committee has reached the overall judgment that cigarette smoking is a health hazard of sufficient importance to the United States to warrant remedial action. There was some stirring and some murmuring in the audience, possibly because of the breadth of the indictment. Dr. Terry concluded, this overall judgment was supported by many converging lines of evidence, as well as by data indicating that cigarette smoking is related to higher death rates in a number of disease categories. In view of the continuing and mounting evidence from many sources, it is the judgment of the committee that cigarette smoking contributes substantially to the mortality from certain specific diseases and to the overall mortality death rate. Sensing the audience was anxious to raise questions, Dr. Terry called for questions. The first question asked was if the report, quote, cons constitutes the official thinking of the Public Health Service belief as regards to smoking and health. Dr. Terry replied, quote, no, this is the report of the committee to the Public Health Service, close quote. He judged the report an excellent report, but until his staff could review it and he had had the opportunity to affirm it, it would not be the official position. Indeed, only the advisory committee, Dr. Guthrie, and the staff required to format the copy for printing had seen the report prior to release in order to maintain security of these findings. Numerous questions were asked of the advisory committee members and about the report's findings. The press conference ended after about an hour. Doors were unlocked and the news reporters ran for the telephones to break their stories. The feature writers and the TV anchors sought out committee members for more background and sound bites. The Saturday evening news and the Sunday papers featured the conclusions of the report on front pages, with high acclaim as did major magazines and periodicals for months. Three decades later, Dr. Stan Glantz published the book Cigarette Papers, disclosing the internal papers of the tobacco companies. This disclosure proved conclusively that the tobacco companies knew in the 1960s, while the advisory committee was meeting, of the deadly effects and the addiction caused by tobacco. One vice president considered that they were in the business of selling an addicting instrument, the cigarette. In the foreword to this book, C. Everett Koop, Surgeon General 1981 through 1989, wrote, and I quote, one can speculate with enormous regret how different that 1964 Surgeon General's report would have been had the tobacco companies shared their research with the Surgeon General's advisory committee. What would have been the history in the United States and the world if that report had had the benefit of all of the information available on tobacco and held privy to the inner circles of the cigarette manufacturing company. The contrast of public and private statements from the tobacco industry reveals their deceit. It's, it's truly amazing, and you've just seen someone who was there at the actual event. 
15 years later, Dr. Cal uh, Joe Califano released another report for the Surgeon General. 20 years later, I was uh, an editor at the New York State Journal of Medicine, and we produced these. This was the first journal in the United States uh, dedicated entirely to the tobacco pandemic. We uh, produced another example in 1985, and a publisher contacted me. We created a book called The Cigarette Underworld. Nobody bought it. I've got all the remainders. If you'd like to see a copy, I'll be happy to sell you. No, we, we have some in our archive. But uh, in the 30th year anniversary, we had an exhibition and an, an event at the Texas Medical Center Library. The 40th anniversary, uh, wrote an editorial in The Lancet. But we were just stagnant, uh, stagnating by this point, and I think that uh, uh, you're seeing that at the end there about the deceit of the tobacco industry, it just never stopped. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Donald Shoplin, who uh, is really living history. He was there uh, that day and, and, and throughout those uh, two years that the report was created. Uh, Don has been the only author, uh, the only one involved with all of the 35 Surgeon General's report. He's an amazing individual. He knows this issue probably better than anyone on earth and uh, would love to have uh, uh, your comments, and also we've got a nice uh, slideshow that you sent us. The, the probably the only pictures of their kind, and uh, yeah. I don't know if you all are familiar with the uh, the old rock and roll song about "Don't talk on Superman's cape, don't spit in the wind." And I, the, at my third one would be rather than uh, what was the guy's name? Uh, don't fool around with Slim. Is that? Never follow Alan Blum at a speaking engagement because it goes downhill from there. When, when Alan asked me to, to attend this meeting, I had no idea what there was I was going to talk about. And so I actually didn't sit down until late yesterday evening and type some remarks out. So if I appear to be reading this somewhat, it's because I am. What I want to do first so is a sort of a segue into what I want to talk about. If you go back, say, 51 years, when they were first talking about establishing this advisory committee, and it had been approved at HUW by the White House, you have to put yourself in the position of Luther Terry and the fact that you were going up against a major industry. It was a huge employer at the time. There were literally thousands and thousands of people that worked on the manufacturing side, there were thousands more that actually were growing tobacco on very small farms, usually one to five acres. There was a huge uh, agricultural industry in terms of Arthur Daniel Midland and people that made fertilizers, insecticides and whatnot. There was also a huge Madison Avenue component because the tobacco industry spent hundreds of millions of dollars in advertising back in the early 1960s. Now they spend probably several billion. So it was with that backdrop that you're now putting out, or you're now talking about establishing an advisory committee that's going to study this issue and report back to you about whether smoking was a health risk. And so when they talked about the selection process for these individuals, they had actually a number of criteria that they wanted it to, uh, to follow. And we've never done this before or since because there was two major upfront criteria that in fact upset quite a few people, both in terms of the health professional groups and the general public. The first of these criteria was that any individual they were going to consider could not have taken a public stand on the smoking health issue, either pro or con. What that effectively did was essentially eliminate anybody who was an expert in the field. Think of it as if you were going to do a study today on climate change and you're going to come out with a definitive report on climate change, but none of the people you're going to appoint to your panel have done any work in this field whatsoever. <coughs> so that was, that was a, a very important uh, uh, equation. The second thing is that none of the Surgeon General's Advisory Committee members could be part of any organization or any or, or, or any, any organized group. They wanted some, they wanted complete independence from any outside influence before they considered producing, in order to produce a totally unbiased review. So actually, how did it, did, the, did it come about? Well, in July of 1962, Terry brought together all of the people that were the stakeholders. These were all the different heads of the voluntary organizations, 
There were people who were part of the uh, Federal Trade Commission, the Food and Drug Administration, and even the Office of, of Science and Technology in the White House. And they were all called to this meeting, as well as representatives from two of the, of the, of the different tobacco industry groups. One was the head of the Tobacco Institute, which was the lobbying arm of the, of the tobacco industry, and the other was the head of what was called the Tobacco Industry Research Committee, which later became the Council for Tobacco Research. And they were the only organizational group that actually had two representatives at, at this meeting. What Terry told them to do is that they wanted to come up with a list of as many people as they could who would be potential nominees to serve on this committee. And they came up during this working meeting with a, with a list of 155 individuals by name. And Terry told them to go back for one week, vet the entire list, and anybody who had any objection to anybody on that list would have complete veto power and they would be eliminated from consideration. They only eliminated five people from that list of 150, 155 people. So they had 150 individuals in which they were now going to put together this panel. The person who actually had responsibility for this was a person by the name of Peter Hamill. He was an epidemi uh, epidemiologist with the Division of Air Pollution Control at PHS. And he was actually charged with the task of actually interviewing these people and formulating the, uh, the committee itself, and those names would be for Luther Terry. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Hamill died just a, a, a few years ago, but I remember seeing at one time this huge schematic that he had put together in terms of how he was going to choose these 12 members. And it was very detailed and included everything from what their colleagues thought of them, you know, where they had gone for their education, what kind of publications they had, could they think across disciplines, were they critical thinkers, could they argue their positions and whatnot. He was the person that was actually the singular most important person in terms of actually putting together the eventually 10-member list of the Surgeon General's Advisory Committee. And it was he that chose the individuals, and it was he that actually interviewed them, and he forwarded the names to Luther Terry. Uh, he talked in a, no, in a series of interviews with the Kennedy uh, Library about the degree of difficulty he had in recruiting a lot of these members. Some he was able to recruit fairly uh, easily, but there was quite a bit of resistance from a number of individuals around the country that, that he just could not get because of time constraints. But a lot of the people actually objected because they were afraid of the way that the criteria was established in terms of who was going to be selected. And I'll give you some examples of this. It was not surprising that some individuals that were invited to join the committee were reluctant to do so because of the controversy over the inclusion of big tobacco in the very selection process. And in fact, Luther Terry got a number of letters from, from a lot of people in academia objecting to this entire process. Mickey LeMater and I actually had gone down a couple of years ago to the National Archives where all of the, of the Surgeon General's Advisory Committee material is stored, and we're actually able to pull out some of the letters that actually was written to Luther Terry, both before the committee selection and after. And I'm going to share a couple of those with you. There was a Dr. David uh, Ruth Stein of, uh, Stein, Stein of Harvard University's Department of Preventive Medicine who wrote to a colleague that was in the executive office of the president in August 1962 strongly objecting to the criteria for selection of the committee prior even to the announcement of the names chosen. And he wrote, and I quote, apparently we are concerned not with a scientific evaluation, but a popularity contest. And he actually quoted the HEW release that talked about scientists who were going to be chosen could not have taken a stand on this issue. He went on in his letter to Dr. Terry, or to his colleague to say, in this long controversy, Almost anyone who has been concerned with this prob problem has already taken a stand. If the objective of this committee is to collect and evaluate all the scientific evidence and prepare a concise and definitive report, it is essential to have the best scientists be selected regardless of whether or not they have taken a previous stand. And this was actually something that a number of other scientists wrote in, essentially objecting to the, to the same thing. But it wasn't just the... Uh, 
people in academia and the research uh, uh, world that I was objecting, there was quite a few letters in there from the, from the general public. One was written by Mrs. Maynard Jones in Minnesota who wrote to Terry in November 1962 objecting to the designation of the committee as unbiased. She stated, now we ask, how can such a committee, selected in part from the name submitted by the tobacco industry, possibly be unbiased? She later expressed concern that the committee may not be trustworthy and in fact may even be dangerous. There was also a lady from Louisville, Kentucky by the name of Mae Shelton who wrote to Dr. Terry on October the 8th, stating, this is one of my favorite letters, I understand Senator Marine Neuberger is trying to do something about the cigarette problem. All of you all should get behind her and help her if you can. Even President Kennedy is afraid to speak out against this dope. I just wonder who this advisory committee is and just how much some of them are being paid by the American tobacco industry to say there is no harm in cigarettes. I'm sure Kennedy would never appoint anyone he thought would cast a vote against it. Surprisingly, there was also a letter that was sent back to Mrs. Shelton from the HEW Director of Public Information trying to so soothe over her concerns. But she quickly wrote back again and saying, when the tobacco industry are making millions and millions of dollars off that dope, they are not going to let anything be done about it. Money talks, you know. You can do anything if you have money. I'll see what your advisory committee comes up with, but I'm sure I already know. Of course, today we know quite well what the committee did come up with. They produced one of the most unique, detailed, insightful, and to the tobacco industry at least, damaging reports ever produced by any government advisory group. That it was accomplished by a group of 10 non-subject matter scientists who didn't know each other, had not, had not worked together previously, is actually amazing. The fact that it was done essentially in about a 12-month time period was nothing short of miraculous, especially given the huge amount of scientific material. There were some 7,000 studies they had to consider that they had to actually shift, sift through and evaluate. Make no mistake about it, the 1964 report was a watershed event in the history of public health. I personally believe it will eventually take its rightful place alongside other disease prevention milestones, such as John Snow's removal of the Broad Street pump in London in 1854 to stem the cholera epidemic, and the 1922 discovery of penicillin by Alexander Fleming, as well as others. While the latter two were instrumental in the fight against infectious disease, the 64 report will be credited with slowing and hopefully eventually reversing the 20th century epidemic of lung and other cancers, coronary heart disease, chronic lung disease due to cigarette smoking. In fact, the New York Public Library, in its 1995 publication titled Books of the Century, labeled the 64 report as one of the most important publications in the past 100 years, along with such works as Albert Einstein's The Meaning of Relativity, Madame Curie's Trinity on uh, Radioactivity, and James Watson's The Double Helix, a personal account of the discovery and the structure of the DNA. I know we have a panel discussion uh, in a little bit that's going to talk about where things currently stand. I, I guess it will, it will be a case of is the glass half full or half empty? But I would like to make note of the fact that since the 64 report came out, we have seen a significant decline in the rate of smoking prevalence in this country. We've cut it in half. Alabama has taken us 50 years to do that. We've also seen significant declines in the rate of coronary heart disease in this country over the past 40 years. We're, we're now seeing declines in the lung cancer death rate, at least among uh, white men since the early 1990s. And now we understand that the, the, the lung cancer death rate for women has at least plateaued and should sh soon decline as well. So we have seen some major public health achievements as a result of Dr. Terry's and, the, and his committee's report and the subsequent actions that we've been able to take as society to stem this uh, 20th century e e uh, epidemic. Thank you.
the, the, the photos? I'll let Andrew get, we're going to show some pictures of, of the, uh, maybe you could arrange for that. Um, that, that, doc, that Don Choplin did send us. That's the committee. Uh, you want to narrate? No. Uh, this, this is actually the committee standing outside of the National Library of Medicine, which was their uh, uh, home headquarters. Uh, they actually met on uh, weekends. They didn't meet during the week because they had such busy schedules. Now uh, called the Lister Hill Library, named after Senator Lister Hill from Alabama. I didn't know that. This is actually a, uh, a meeting of the committee. Uh, I don't know if you can see the sort of the, the structure that stands about six feet tall. This was standing right outside of our offices. We were literally no more than about 15 feet away. And we aptly called that structure the bullpen because that's where all the discussions took place. And some of it, believe me, believe me was quite heated. Oh, th oh, this is taken with Luther Terry at an award ceremony. This handsome devil over here on the very right, uh, he, he hasn't changed a bit in 50 years. I, I just don't understand it. Uh, this is a, uh, Peter Hamill is uh, standing uh, behind Terry. He's the, uh, the second one to his immediate left there. He was the one that actually uh, put together the Surgeon General's Advisory Committee. This is the, uh, the majority of the, of the uh, committee staff. This is at the award ceremony as well. Are those ashtrays? On the yeah, unfortunately, we still had ashtrays in HUW back then. And this is the individual committee members. You can say a pathologist, was he not? Uh, uh, I don't think oh, okay. so. Wouldn't, uh, Bain Jones was, at, was from um, Cornell, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Burdett, uh, who uh, was a surgeon and a geneticist from the University of Utah, I had the chance to meet him at the 30th anniversary. We, commended, we commemorated the report, and he came unannounced and, and was in the audience and introduced himself. Quite a gentleman. Um, I don't know about uh, William Cochran, but he became the statistical director, I believe. And he was not on the original list of, of 150. He was actually recommended by uh, Mort Spiegelman, mm -hmm. who was on that list, and they actually had to go back to the group to get approval because he wasn't on that list of 150. You're about to meet Dr. Farber in a couple of minutes. He was both a pathologist and a physician. Uh, I mean, he, I, he had a chemistry degree and, and many, many degrees. He was an amazing uh, person. Jacob Firth, I don't know much about. Um, and Louis Pfizer, we don't hear much about. Uh, he, uh, Pfizer was actually Pfizer. from Harvard, and, and he was a, uh, he was responsible for um, uh, napalm, as a matter of fact. Oh, deal. yes, yeah. 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 remember that one. And uh, Dr. Guthrie was really the... He, he, was, he was a staff director. Uh, Peter Hamill got sick in August of 63, had to leave immediately, and Dr. Guthrie actually took over and actually was the one that shepherded the report uh, from about April on, and he was the one that actually oversaw all the, it was, it, he oversaw the printing of the very end. The Surgeon General's report is the only non-military, non-national security report that was printed as top secret. And Dr. Hickam uh, from Indiana University, I think that, oh, and Dr. Hundley who was another staff member, right? Yes, yeah, he right. chared all of the right. committee. Uh, and then, of course, our own Dr. LeMater. And Dr. Seavers uh, was, uh, I think he was for a while a chairman, was he not, or no? Oh, he, it's an, he went to the American Medical Association Committee. You'll see that in the film. Um, but just to, maybe we could play this uh, little surprise because th you're about to meet a very fascinating man who's uh, in Columbia, South Carolina. He's 94 years old, and it is uh, Dr. Emmanuel Farber. Uh, he was discovered by a medical student. Uh, Andrew Seidenberg, who is a first-year medical student at the University of South Carolina, who interviewed him about two months ago and kindly agreed to let us show this and to excerpt this for today. I think he approached me in July, or the June of 62. Uh, then my name was put up, but it wasn't final. So my name was put up, and they asked me, would I do that? I said, well, I'm not very anxious, but all right, okay, put it on, because I'm not a very big, not a big fan of, of committees. I don't, committees, to me, don't do much. They just talk. <laughs> so, and that's why this committee is very unusual, because it led to something. Right. But I was, in, uh, to me, committees were just to for, for, just to spend some time and talk. And I had no time to talk. I wanted to do research. So why do you think they asked you to be on the committee? That's right. I was, 
I was well, well known as a pathologist. Okay. And they knew I was a biochemist and a pathologist, so they figured, well, he'd be a good man on the committee because he has a broad base. Many people's names were put on a few hundred, but most of them were dropped because of somebody objected. But nobody objected to me. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> but do you think the, the industry had a say in who oh, got absolutely. on the committee? Absolutely. And I, they didn't know me and I didn't know them. And I think that's probably one of the reasons they, because if, if, they, if the person they selected had been anti-industry, they would never have been selected. Never. So as far as I can tell, nobody here was anti-industry in, uh, because they would never have been selected on the committee. See, the committee had to be, had to be well known, have, have good records, and not objectionable by either academic or by, by medicine or by industry. It's sort of neutral. So you're asked to join this committee, then you find out you're, you've yeah. been selected. At that point, what were your expectations? Oh, I mean, none, nothing. Just okay. Being the committee, I had no idea what we were going to do. All I knew was that smoking was becoming important. So, okay, let's see what we can do. But I didn't have any commitments as far as smoking and so on. This wasn't part of my, my ethos at all. <clears throat> and how often did you meet as a committee? Oh, Where did you meet? Too often. Every, every couple of months we met. And we met as a committee. And then we met, oh, uh, I spent, let's say, the committee was formed officially in November of 62. And we met all of 63, almost I did very little work in Pittsburgh. I mean, did still some of the church, but not, not as much as I wanted to, because I was involved in this. Maybe every, every couple of weeks we had a meeting. But the main thing is we visited places where they were doing research on smoking. And to find out, you know, what's, uh, what they're doing and then try to evaluate how good the research is. As part of our job was to say what, what people are doing and is this worthwhile. Now, we, we weren't experts in the but we had such a variety of people on the committee that most of us could, not most of us, but we, the committee in all could get a pretty good idea is if this really good work or not good work. And then uh, we would only Pay attention to the not it's the good work, ignore the not good work. See, so uh, so we would meet individually rather. I would go, or maybe my being another colleague or two or three of us, go spend a few days at the place, come back and report to the committee, and others did have the same way. So the committee really went all over, report, found out what people were doing, come back, we discussed it. And then we say, is this worthwhile, is it not, is it going to be helpful, and so on and so forth. Was any of it industry research? Uh, well, industry was, was pretty, we didn't go into much industry, because their position was very straight, straightforward. It's safe. Well, if you go, if you're doing research to prove, what kind of research is it? I mean, we didn't do research to prove anything. We did research to find out. And then we would make a decision, but I didn't make, didn't want to do research, but I knew what I was going to find, then do it. That's not my idea of research, <laughs> you know. Right. So, uh, so we didn't go into the industry at all. The industry was concerned with the whole committee, obviously, and they tried to put some pressure, but fortunately we objected to the committees, to, to the industries in the end. So we, we stayed away from that as far as we could. We were aware of it. We were aware of a lot of activity that's going on in the industry, but we stayed our hands clear of that. Fascinating. He um, really hit on the point of just how hard the industry worked to really prevent this report from coming out. I have a little surprise before the film. Last week I met with former Secretary of Health, Education and Welfare, Joe Califano, and he told me a little story. Uh, see if I have it on tape here. 
Luther Terry. Luther Terry was like the guy that planted the seed in a tree that grew to be an enormous tree. I mean, he was alone when he put that out. It required enormous courage uh, to, to do that. He didn't just put it out like a thousand other Washington reports get put out every year. He did something with it. He publicized it. He made it an issue that he was committed to. And he ultimately set the stage for what I did when I became secretary of HEW. I mean, I, we, we, we geared the whole, you know, sort of public anti-smoking campaign to the 15th anniversary of the Luther Terry Surgeon General's report on smoking, which we put out uh, in, in 1979. Uh, and the, the amazing thing was, when you think about the, the, the 64 report, which, which nailed lung cancer, it didn't really nail heart disease. There wasn't enough data available for that. But in the interim, uh, because of that 64 report, uh, not, think of it not just as a public event, a public item, but that inspired so much research. Uh, when you look at the, the Surgeon General's report 15 years later, it's a few inches thick, okay? What is it? Just reports in peer-reviewed academic journals about the relationship of smoking, not just to lung cancer, but other cancers, to heart disease, to emphysema. Without Luther Terry, that never would have happened. Never would have happened. Well, uh, you know, he was terrific, and uh, uh, he's been uh, uh, an amazing individual. We're going to tell you a little story also when Dr. Lutch speaks later. But uh, uh, I think we're almost to the, uh, the, the, the main event, which was the film that uh, we created here at the university. I did forget to thank a couple of people. I appreciated uh, Vice President Nelson coming and, and others from the university, and Thad Elson, our vice dean at the college, and Nell Williams, our librarian, and our other librarians. And thank you. And Brett, who's the other student that I forgot to mention. But uh, this is a 23-minute film that we did uh, thanks to Billy Field, who approached me. Uh, he runs a film course here. Billy Field used to direct Trapper John M.D. in Hollywood. And uh, he uh, had some very creative students wanting to do some films. And they created a, a preliminary version. And then I took that. And thanks to Lindley and others, uh, Jake Butner and my son Samuel, we created Blowing Smoke. 